Um, hello, good uh, morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon, depending on wherever you are around the world. Uh, my name is Rafaela Pantucci, uh, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this Young China Watchers um, webinar session. Um, this session is part of a series that Young China Watchers is running at the moment um, of global webinars um, that is looking at the question of China's borderland relations. Um, and what we're trying to do is trying to understand in as much detail as, as we can, talking to people who are real experts, who are from the countries that we're talking about, trying to understand exactly what China's borderland relations look like. Um, <clears throat> Young China Watchers, for those of you who don't know, is a global organization with chapters in 10, 10 countries around the world. Um, and is basically a network that is focused on trying to connect up the next generation or the up and coming generation of people who are interested in China. Our members are from all walks of life. Uh, most have an interest in China. Some work on China, but not all do. Um, and basically what brings all together is our trying to understand China as it is today and how it's going. And this webinar series is one that we started with a specific idea of, as I say, trying to understand China's borderland relations. Um, we did our first session uh, just over a month ago, I think it was now, with Professor Taylor Fravel, who helped us set the context for China's borderland relations, drawing on his extensive work looking at how China's managed its land relations all this time, you know, for, well, since the creation of the, of the CCP. And we're delighted today that we're going to be focusing on Afghanistan. Um, our idea in this series is to eventually get around to cover all of the uh, countries around uh, China. Um, so we've got, you know, uh, somewhere in the region of 14 or so webinars still to go. Um, but we wanted to do one first on Afghanistan because we recognize that Afghanistan is very much um, the subject of the moment. Um, and we're really delighted and honored that to talk about this subject, we are joined by uh, Dr. Tamim Asay, who is a former Afghan Deputy Defense Minister um, who is currently running two think tanks at the same time. <laughs> One, the uh, Institute for War and Peace Studies, and the second, the Council on Foreign Relations in Afghanistan. And Tamim is a longtime expert who's looked at all sorts of security questions. I first came across Tamim as part of some projects we were running, looking at Afghanistan and its sort of neighborhood. So he's very well versed on the sort of broader subjects of Afghanistan's border relations. And what Af Tamim has kindly agreed to do today is join us and talk a bit about China's specific borderland relations with Afghanistan. The way we're gonna run this event is uh, by me and Tamim having a discussion. And I'm gonna encourage people in the audience from wherever you are to please feed your questions into the chat function. And my wonderful colleagues, Josh and Sam, who you won't unfortunately see, but are the ones who are really making this event happen. Um, we'll be looking at them, collecting them, and we'll feed those questions to me, and then I'll put them to Tamim as our sort of conversation progresses. But all we would ask, uh, you know, if you don't want to identify yourself uh, in great detail, that's fine. But we'd be grateful if you could tell us what city or what country you are sending us your question from. Um, this is an event that we have specifically timed to try to capture all of our global chapters. Uh, that includes our ones on the East Coast in America, our ones in Europe, and our ones out here in Asia. Um, so we really are trying to get that sort of sense of global community of YCW. Um, but enough of me sort of wittering on introducing uh, this event. Um, we've got our excellent guest, Tamim, who's very kindly joined us uh, to talk about these questions. Um, and so Tamim, I think to try to get us going, um, could you talk to us a little bit about China's borderlands with Afghanistan? Um, talk us through exactly how big that border is and maybe try to set the context and a bit of the history um, around that specific uh, part of Afghanistan, that very remote, <laughs> might add, part of Afghanistan. So please, Tamim, over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Raf, for the kind introduction and generous introduction. It's a pleasure and honor to be uh, amongst you, and let me also thank Josh and Sam for uh, for this event. Um, I see there are many uh, uh, faces, uh, some I know, uh, who have joined this uh, event, so I'm grateful for that. Um, but before I answer your question, uh, let me quickly say that the perspectives that I uh, give today is really my personal views uh, does not represent the organizations that I work with. 
but it's based on the dozens of interactions that I've had both in official capacity as well as in uh, personal capacity in my many visits to China. Um, and um, I would like this session to be as interactive as possible rather than a one way me saying a lot of things. Um, so, um, um, and also the view I would present is very uh, from a realism perspective. So you don't want to hear a lot of um, textbook um, narratives from me. Um, uh, it's, it's going to be real politic with a lens of on interest on, 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 on what are the interests of China and how Afghans view it. And essentially um, in Afghan view, uh, there are many internationals who have delved into it. Um, so I don't want to do that. Um, but coming back to your question on the border, it's a 76 kilometer, 46, 47 mile. Uh, it used to be a tri point, it's now a quadri point. It's really highlands, uh, so in, it's high and accessible. I've had the honor of visiting it once when I was to be defense minister. And um, it's an incredibly important and a strategic intersection point. And I think with times coming, it will become more and more important. Um, historically, that area um, has been a highland and highly inaccessible, but it has a lot of history uh, in, in spite of being um, you know, mountainous and highlands. Um, if you look at it in mid 18th century, uh, the, during the Qing dynasty, um, uh, there were several uh, fights that happened there at that time um, between the Chinese Qing Dynasty and the at time um, and the uh, uh, various Khanates that used to be uh, there. Um, so it has been traditionally a clash point. But let me put it in perspective. There is on the Afghan side, there is the Wakhan corridor. Um, on the Tajikistan side, it is really uh, uh, the Tashkurgan area uh, that intersects at that point. And then on the Chinese side is the Xinjiang you know, autonomous region. Um, and uh, then on the Pakistan side, it's the Gilgit Baltistan or the Ch Chitral area um, that is there. And it's one of those areas um, where four countries intersect. But it also has a lot of history of criminal activities there. At the same time, jihadist and terrorist activities that happens there. And essentially, during the Cold War, when the Sino-Soviet split, split that happened, Chinese joined the American side in the Afghan Jihad, well, the Global um, American Alliance. And it was on the will of those countries, except Tajikistan at that time, was used as a corridor um, to supply Mujahideens. And to this day, uh, the Zibak and the Topan area, which are on the Afghan side, um, through the Chetral side, as well as through the Tajik side, is a corridor for various jihadist um, groups to pass. And it's, high, and it's also very difficult to police it because first it's highlands, second, there are various routes that people, you cannot put soldiers on all of those routes. Plus there is a history of smuggling um, of human and uh, opium and you know, other, um, um, uh, other um, items. Um, but, but essentially this corridor has, I mean, the, 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 the historical background of it goes all the way to Silk Road times. Um, uh, when Buddhists used to use it as a thoroughfare to, uh, you know, go back and forth uh, to Afghanistan and, uh, you know, go and visit the big Buddha statues in Bamiyan. Um, but the border, uh, the, the actual border was defined during the great game uh, between Russians and, um, and the Brits. Um, Afghans and Chinese had no say in it. It was as a part of that uh, agreement uh, that defined the border between Afghanistan and China. It wasn't until 1963 when the Afghan king, Zai Shah, through a border commission together with the Chinese side, um, really um, formulated and, uh, uh, and bifurcated the, the border area of Afghanistan. Um, 
and in 1963 an agreement was signed and that border was uh, demarcated um, uh, officially between Afghanistan um, and, Ch and China and then subsequently had John Lai and others uh, visiting Afghanistan uh, senior Chinese uh, officials um, and then a period of indifference followed and as I said the Cold War started and when the Cold War started because of the Sino-Soviet split that border actually became a corridor all at the behest of those powers, uh, including China, a corridor uh, of supply of, of various Mujahideen factions um, to go after the Red Army. Thank you uh, for that, Tamim. I think that's a, a really uh, interesting history. And I think uh, the way you painted it, it's sort of remote uh, nature and the sort of deep history that it has uh, really shows, uh, you know, the sort of connection that's always been there uh, with China. Uh, you mentioned that you'd visited it in a, in a professional capacity when you were um, in your former government position. Um, I wonder if you could talk us through a bit your, your experience of visiting there, and I presume this was in part connected to trying to do something that was of interest to the Chinese. I wonder if you could talk us through your experience in some ways of working with the Chinese when you were in your uh, formal government position. So yes, I have visited that area uh, up to a certain uh, part because it's highly inaccessible to the Afghan side. From the Chinese side, they have built really good roads and you know infrastructure um, all the way to the demarcation point. Um, I think four things really stood out. Um, that first one, and the main reason why many of us visited, was because uh, there is a still terrorist activities there the Zibak Chetral area and the Tophana Valley uh, connection with the Pakistani Chetral, as well as on the Kashgar side, on the, uh, you know, uh, uh, Tajikistan side. Uh, still um, various terrorist organizations, including, um, you know, the Uzbeks, the Tajiks and um, others, um, Islamic uh, extremists, use it um, for taro uh, fair as well as for supply and as well as um, to um, engage in other uh, activities including smuggling um, so that is one that this is a historical um, uh, taro fair um, as well as a corridor as well as it still holds relevance to this state and the only side which is really developed is the Chinese side where they have better accessibility, plus there are oxygen problems there and uh, many other challenges of, of securing that particular um, quadri point intersection of four countries. The second thing is that the Chinese always wanted a border commission there, uh, a, a, what they call a border coordination center. And Afghans uh, and Tajiks and Pakistanis together with the Chinese uh, trying to build infrastructure there, as well as assisting, um, you know, these three countries to secure that particular area. The third thing which really stood out is um, the uh, amount of Chinese interest uh, to ensure um, the security of this quadri point uh, at highlights, because I think uh, Chinese side believed uh, that. Um, the, the Americans as well as the Indians could use this, um, uh, including probably the Russians through Tajiks um, as a as a as a corridor to foment um, the stability uh, in Xinjiang area of of China. And finally, there's a lot of uh, not a lot, but there's um, some amount of criminal activity, including smuggling um, and. Uh, you know, uh, uh, other drug related criminal activities. Um, there are, there is, um, I mean, the, the major area, the major problem uh, is really the Chitra on the Pakistani side. And we, we have Pakistani forces there uh, with Wakhjir, which is the Wakhjir corridor, uh, which goes through Afghanistan with Tajikistan as well. Those were the two concentration points uh, that the Chinese had a lot of uh, concern about it. And um, they were offering various incentives 
for Afghans, Pakistan is one of us, to sign a quadrilateral border security agreement, as well as sharing intelligence and you know, other, um, other activities. Uh, we were engaged uh, with them uh, to ensure that they, um, you know, the, the border is secure. But the problem was, of course, on the Afghan side. First, the distress. Secondly, um, um, uh, it was the infrastructure that was not built. And thirdly, um, I think regardless of the Afghan government, the Chinese have started certain covert activities um, for their own border security of engaging with non-state actors on the Badakhshan area of both Tajikistan and Afghanistan. On the, and, and the Afghans were seriously um, uh, you know, uh, concerned that um, China's non-interventionist narrative is actually becoming more interventionist in Afghanistan by engaging with local warlords on the Badakhshan side of Afghanistan and by engaging with um, other actors and strong men um, to ensure their border security. Now, I must say that maybe they have been disappointed uh, on the Afghan government or other security providers, state security providers, and that's why they resorted to non-state security uh, providers to ensure border security. I, I, it's fascinating to hear you talk about it. And I think the, the way you've articulated, the way the Chinese were engaging was really kind of reaching out to a range of different actors. But, you know, you mentioned something in there that it occurred to me, you know, uh, uh, that I've always wondered about is there was this famous quadrilateral group that they formed and started hosting sessions in 2016 that, as far as I can tell, has gone very quiet. Do you know, I mean, did it ever actually achieve anything, this quadrilateral organization? And do, did it still exist when, you know, before the government uh, uh, in Kabul fell? Or had it gone into sort of remiss, remission, if you will? No, it continued until the Kabul, until the uh, last republic uh, fell. Okay. Um, but in a quiet way. Um, but it was essentially they wanted to build a, a, a border commission um, and for the good of all four countries uh, um, from a, uh, you know, to be fair and from a realistic point of view. Um, the problem was, of course, we had certain limitations. They had their own limitations. Um, and the Pakistanis had their own reservations, <clears throat> plus the distrust that was there between uh, the four countries. Pakistan never trusted uh, you know, Afghanistan, Afghanistan never trusted Tajikistan, Tajikistan did not trust all the three. So like all uh, uh, bordering countries, uh, you always uh, see the other party, no matter how good their intentions are because of your territorial integrity and sovereignty issues with a degree of suspicion. and and. I mean, Afghanistan, Pakistan has a history of, of, of uh, you know, issues there. But essentially, um, you know, the problem was Chitral area. Uh, on the Afghan and Tajik side, the problem was um, really smuggling and criminal activities. The, historically, the ETIN was based in northern South Waziristan and used the Chitral corridor to go to the Tophana area. Um, uh, to um, uh, to carry out you know destabilizing activities um, in China, and they have also carried out destabilizing and killed many Afghans and Pakistanis as well. Um, I mean, ETIM fighters have been fighting in Afghanistan for almost two decades now, and they have thousands of Afghan blood on their hand, um, and and they're fierce fighters. I must say, um, probably the, the the fiercest amongst foreign fighters that are in Afghanistan. But um, again, uh, the, the problem has always been, uh, of course, the Chitral, uh, Badakhshan, uh, and Tajikistan, and Xinjiang, uh, Tophana, and Zivak area, Chitral, Tophana, and Zivak area, used as a corridor uh, to foment uh, the stability both in Afghanistan, China, and uh, to some extent in, in, in uh, Tajikistan. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating to hear you talk about it in such detail, because of course, you know, looked at it on a map, it's a very small part, <laughs> but the complexity of all these relations around these four countries that all share this very 
small and very strategically significant area is 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 of course incredible. Um, I see we've already got some questions that have fed in, and I would encourage our our, our attendees to please continue to do that. Uh, I'll start putting these um to Tamim, but I, I wonder, Tamim, if before I start to switch over to some of the questions, um, how do you think any of this dynamic has changed now with the new, uh, you know, Taliban, uh, you know, authority? Uh, that we have in Kabul. Do you think the dynamics you've been describing have changed dramatically, or or, or how do you think? And how do you think China is uh, finding managing uh, this new dynamic? Well, the dynamics wouldn't change because Chinese national interests wouldn't change, no matter who is in charge in Kabul. Uh, the border wouldn't change. Um, in fact, since Taliban assumed power or overtaking power. Um, the ETIM activities have increased across Afghanistan. And when Taliban took over power, they went and opened the gates of various Afghan prisons where there were thousands of ETIM fighters, uh, if not hundreds, plus their families. Now, all those people are out. Uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, of course, that is a problem for China. It's a problem for Afghanistan too, um, because um, our former, well, the, the former Afghan army and police and others fought many battles to get, the, to get these people. And as I said, they were really fierce fighters. Um, and Taliban um, have had, have been talking to the, to the Chinese since at least 2007, if not um, before, but it was lots of um, the usual, connections of quiet and silent meetings behind closed doors. Um, so you, the Chinese and the Taliban have, through the Pakistani intermediation, have a strong uh, relations. Um, but as history has shown, and as Taliban have shown time and again, they never give up their jihadi brothers. Um, they play ball. Uh, I would be really interested um, to see, and to this day, I have not seen any evidence that the Taliban have actually taken action against ETIM or have handed over ETIM to the Pakistanis or to the, um, to the Chinese. Um, but uh, overall, the Chinese perspectives towards Afghanistan, um, contrary to all the Western media that I hear uh, and read, is very much um, security centric. And uh, there is a huge uh, uh, security lens to it. If you look at Chinese aid contribution to Afghanistan, including the in-kind ones, it's um, $380 million or something for the last 20 years, which is essentially probably one USAID project. The, uh, if you look at their, uh, the two concessions, the mineral concessions they got, they never developed any one of them. They followed a set-in policy and then started disputing it. Um, um, uh, both with INAC copper mine as well as the gas um, uh, in, uh, uh, concession they got up in the north. Um, um, so, so China has a very specific defined national security interest towards Afghanistan. And the view they have of Afghanistan is of the three, um, if I could put it that way. First, it's a, secure, it's a source of instability and security threat for them. So they have to tame it and find ways to deal with it, whether it's the Taliban, the Republic, the resistance, whoever is in charge. The second thing um, that they're really concerned about and they have an interest in Afghanistan is to ensure the security of CPEC as well as their West Corridor, the, the projects that go through Central Asia. And thirdly, um, that um, there is no um, malign actor in the form of United States or India or even Russia for that matter um, uh, in their backyard in Afghanistan that could foment the stability um, through Afghanistan in the Xinjiang area. Now some people are talking about that maybe Russia and China could um, uh, follow a model of Central Asia where they divide labor um, and you know, one would be the security provider, the other would be interested in its mineral resources and, and wealth and plus um, you know, the corridor uh, function. 
Um, I don't think we are there yet, and I have not seen credible evidence and actions on the part of the Chinese to have formulated such a vision towards Afghanistan. Now, one thing is clear, that uh, China have, cannot rise with Afghanistan being up in flames in its, in its neighborhood. Um, China has been really good at managing its neighborhood relations with its neighbors, and it can offer many lessons. But I think in, Af on, in case of Afghanistan, it's a challenge that they have not met before. So that's why um, I think it, it's a new phenomenon for them. Um, and it's not the 14 plus neighbors that they did before and fixed all their the border dispute and other issues. Afghanistan is a peculiar case in Chinese neighborhood, um, and, and it will require more efforts and resources from the Chinese side. That's uh, uh, fascinating. I think you're exactly right. I think it, it presents a very particular challenge to China because they've never had to manage this kind of complexity. And also the fact that it's a neighbor, of course, means that it's not, you know, it's it has immediate and direct sort of consequences to the state, which makes it a sort of very particularly uh, complicated set of questions. Um, I'm going to start taking questions from our audience now um, to because we've had a whole bunch coming in, um, uh, quite a few from North America, I might add, to start us off. Um, and uh, we've got a, a question, a few questions from uh, Frostburg State University. Um, and one of the questions is looking at the specific question of drug trafficking. Um, so you talked about some of this trafficking going through the Wakhan. And I suppose the question that's been asked is, you know, it, it seems, as you pointed out, it's very remote um, and it's quite a relatively small area. Um, it feels, uh, I wonder if you talk a little bit more about the ease of which stuff could actually flow through there because it feels like it should be quite difficult. And the idea of drugs and terrorism potentially going through there into China uh, feels like you know quite, uh, quite a sort of remote possibility. So I wonder if you could talk us through how those flows kind of work. You touched on this a little bit before. Um, but I, I think people are curious to know what, what, how, how you can kind of explain that, because certainly the Chinese border is very tight, <laughs> I know that. Um, but I'm wondering the, the sort of broad area, if you could talk us through how those flows kind of work. Well, um, there is an entire local ecosystem for criminal activities which have existed since many years, um, maybe decades. And there are local roots and local power players who have vested interest in the opium trade there and also in mineral wealth. Um, not many people know that Afghanistan's Badakhshan area is very rich mineral wise. I mean, in terms of lapis lazuli, in terms of um, other high value, um, uh, you know, uh, minerals which are there, including gold and gold mines and others. Um, so there's an entire ecosystem of local power brokers who are sitting on various mineral wealth um, uh, and who are also engaged in um, weapons smuggling, uh, opium smuggling. Um, and opium has been, um, weapons smuggling and opium smuggling, as well as giving refuge to various dissidents of those areas, even from the times of Hunnets. And Badakhshan has been a dissident capital of the various Hunnets and you know, from starting from 18th century, um, people who came there because of its rugged uh, geography uh, to seek uh, refuge. Now they have mules, they have they know local routes, uh, they have adapted to that environment uh, of low oxygen in a way, if I could put it this way. And um, especially if you look at the Afghanistan. Um, I mean, the entire area, not only Afghanistan, Tajikistan area. They also have uh, familial relations um, and, and uh, tribal relations, which many people simply think because they're just Chinese, maybe they don't, they are not Khojas or they're not, they don't have some connection um, which goes back um, uh, to their uh, Turkic uh, roots or, or familial relations. In spite of this, uh, the various uh, forced displacement policies, which were followed by various governments during uh, you know, many, many, including on the Afghan government side, which goes many, many years, but that has not broken those ties. Now they use mules, they use various other um, um, uh, mediums um, to transport 
Mellor wealth, opium, um, as well as weapons. Um, and there is an entire market uh, that is uh, functioning there. And um, it has been there for hundreds of years. And I think it would uh, take a lot of effort and resources, um, like any rugged area, to be able to bring that under control. Um, I, for one, don't think that in recent future, in recent you know, future, anybody would be able to do it, including the Chinese, because of the vast amount of resources that it requires to police it. Yeah, so I, I think we're, you know, essentially your your key point that you pointed out before is nothing much is really going to change there now with the new government um, on either side. Um, I wonder if I could uh, slightly change and talk about um, uh, talk about some of the sort of more uh, contemporary uh, questions. Um, I, I mean, you know, the question of Pakistan, it's one that you've touched on a few times before. And a question that we've had asked is, you know, how much or, or to what extent do you think that the Chinese will rely on Pakistan as a kind of mediator for their relations with the uh, new Taliban authority that we have um, in Kabul at the moment? Um, and I wonder if you can sort of talk maybe what way you're touching on that sort of very contemporary aspect of your sort of analysis of that. Maybe take us through a little bit, um, you know, the sort of your experience when you were uh, serving in your government and also even before that, if you can give us a sense of how that history of that relationship um, has sort of played out and how much China will sort of use uh, uh, the Pakistan as a sort of um, as a mediator, if you will, or a point of contact. Well, essentially, it depended on on uh, what China, uh, how China has changed over time. Um, first, it was a introvert, uh, you know, focus at home type of China, which um, which relied heavily on Pakistan uh, for its relations, uh, as well as uh, for its Cold War, you know, calculations vis-a-vis uh, -vis Afghanistan. That is why when the Sino-Soviet split happened, it was essentially Pakistan doing the doorkeeping um, and um, the corridor for dealing with various jihadists uh, uh, for the Chinese. And the Chinese were selling their weapons uh, with, Amer you know, getting funding from the Americans and very, providing other various services. But it was really the Pakistani ISI essentially the front office uh, managing relations, not only for China, but for many other countries as well. Um, when China became, um, when the 9-11 happened, I think, um, up until uh, 2006, a Chinese realized um, that, um, and Chinese character also changed because um, they were this rising power uh, and effectively, a lot of people were challenging the narratives that was being fed to them by the Pakistanis. So in 2007, um, based on whatever my personal experience has been, Chinese started taking um, uh, Pakistani security narrative with a grain of salt and started talking to various other actors, and they did not just only rely uh, on Pakistan security and military establishment to give them advice, perspective, or counsel. In 2014, when China was on its way to become the second greatest economic power, and we saw um, an assertive China, a China who wanted to get out in the region, and um, um, I, I would say become more interventionist in a way to assert itself as a global power. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis Pakistan, that changed. So China started appointing special envoy for Afghanistan, talking to the Russians, to the Americans, cooperated uh, with the Americans, I must say, on, on many occasions, um, and started directly talking to the, to the, uh, to the Taliban since 2007. Um, so right now, there's um, uh, there's a deep suspicion, even though they, yes, they hear uh, the council and, uh, of, of the Pakistanis um, and they talk to them and they're the major, you know, they're the, they're the main corridor for them to deal with these extremist groups, but um, it's not that um, usual business of 100% total reliance on Pakistan because of the suspicions that they have. Plus, um, 
almost all of the ETIM players uh, that was arrested, interrogated, ended up um, being trained in some Pakistani madrasa. Um, um, it wasn't the American narrative or our nar Afghan narrative or I don't know, Indian narrative. It was just themselves speaking where they were trained, equipped, in spite of assurances by Pakistan establishment that there is no ATI and there are no wheelers in our area, in Waziristan area or in other areas, fomenting in the stability in St. Langari. So I think when, when the Chinese saw for themselves, then in spite of assurances over many years, these guys are still uh, trained in, 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 in various parts of Pakistan, they started taking a back seat and, and you know, you know the Chinese way, which is they don't tell you up front, but they start taking measures to ensure um, that you, um, to ensure their own security, but still listen to you and, and you know, uh, hear you out uh, because of the strategic partnership that exists um, between China and Pakistan. That's fascinating. I mean, I think um, the, the, in a way what the, what you're describing is a relationship between Washington and Islamabad, I'm, I'm sorry, between <laughs> Beijing and Islamabad, which is not dissimilar to the relationship between Islamabad and, and Washington in many ways, which is... is, yeah, I, must, is I, think, I must add one thing. Beijing has always viewed Afghanistan through the lens of another country. So it has always been either Sino-Soviet split, Sino-American mm -hmm. split, Sino-Pakistani split, Sino-Delhi, I mean, the India split. Afghans had little agency. Um, uh, so it was just like many other countries, um, uh, essentially uh, 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 viewing Afghanistan um, through the prism of another country or the activities of another country or another power that exists, uh, that, that has been present in Afghanistan. Um, uh, and that is why they had those strategic calculations on their part um, to ensure that Afghanistan remains, you know, at least uh, threat neutral to them. Um, I wonder if we could uh, telescope out a little bit more while we're on the subject kind of regional relations. I'm going to try to merge two questions that are coming together, one from uh, someone in Canada and one from uh, someone in Washington. And, you know, how does this dynamic uh, play out against of of course, India, which is a very historically contentious relationship with uh, Islamabad, and of course has always had a very complicated relationship with um, with Beijing and, and even with Kabul. So I, I wonder if you could, and, and also in talking about India, I wonder if you could sort of talk us a little bit through how the other powers, so Iran and then the Central Asians, are you know responding to the approach that they see Beijing taking towards uh, the uh, Taliban-led uh, authorities. So um, the, the first thing, um, Beijing is now in a wait and watch uh, attitude um, towards the Taliban um, caretaker government. Um, so they are really observing, but they are deeply engaged um, at lower levels as, as well as behind closed doors, uh, back channels with the Taliban on their security interests as well as on um, regional matters. Secondly, any recognition by Beijing um, would, um, uh, would come in the form of a regional collective recognition, which is really a Pakistani uh, view, as you heard Prime Minister Imran Khan saying that if Pakistan is going to recognize it as the, uh, the Taliban government, um, it will be a collective regional uh, 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 recognition. And I don't think it will come anytime soon. Um, and the way usual, and the usual Chinese way is wait for everybody and, you know, um, um, be careful uh, not to upset uh, uh, anyone. So I think Beijing is not going to replace the United States or NATO in terms of financial or economic assistance or providing security. All these reports I was reading, though, you know, the, the Chinese came and are assessing the Bagram Air Base to station the PLA there in Afghanistan will be the first theater for PLA to check their interoperability and, and all that. Uh, uh, I think it's um, maybe from an intelligence perspective, they did, they did visit it uh, for intelligence value, but that's also highly unplausible. Uh, but there is no way that the Chinese, uh, at least from what I see, and I've, I've not seen any evidence of it, 
that China is going to be the alternative for the United States and for other actors. They simply, they might have the economic resources because of their new economic uh, realities and, be and because they have so much financial and economic power, but they simply lack the experience and lack the um, uh, uh, PLA is just not there to be able to do those things um, and have, does not have the experience and the capacity and the skills. Now, um, in terms of Chinese view of the Indians' presence in Afghanistan, it was highly suspicious. Um, uh, India and Afghanistan have been, uh, have had a strategic partnership agreement signed. India has been one of the major um, donors, non-traditional donors of Afghanistan. India has uh, been, has funded dams and, and you know thousands of scholarships provided to Afghans. Um, so yes, uh, deep suspicion of Indian activities and Indian prisons because they thought this is destabilizing uh, both Pakistan and China. Uh, I remember once uh, within the Afghan government, uh, at one point the Indian ambassador requested a visit to Badakhshan. It was not even close to Wuhan. I mean, Badakhshan is just a province. And we heard, and uh, we got like dozens of calls and, and uh, private complaints that it should never be given even consideration. Um, as so many episodes like that we have had um, in, my, in our many visits that we have had one of the prominent and constant questions of the Chinese were what are the Indians doing in Afghanistan you know what are their interests so why they have so much uh, why Bollywood why everybody's watching Bollywood for example I mean um, 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 or, or the soft and uh, hard uh, component of Indian presence in Afghanistan but I think the Indian presence and security interests in Afghanistan has often been over exaggerated, um, uh, both vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan as well as vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Yes, they were present, they had huge soft and you know, uh, hard influence, um, but uh, the destabilizing factor of it, um, uh, because it was not only Afghan government there, there were 42 countries in that, and many of them were friends of China and Pakistan, uh, 42 uh, with the highest, uh, you know, um, intelligence capabilities, uh, superpowers were there, including the US and others. And if they saw any activities uh, destabilizing uh, Pakistan or China, they would have had, of course, uh, intervened. Uh, and that's what, why we kept telling the Chinese that if you think that oh, the Afghan government and India is in cahoots and trying to destabilize Pakistan or China, uh, you know, maybe if you don't believe us, talk to the Americans, talk to, uh, to the Brits, talk to the Europeans, talk to 42 nations with all their militaries who are there, uh, who you trust and who, have, who are much more professional in their dealings at international relations. So I think it was overhyped, over-exaggerated um, to probably justify intervention, uh, their interventions in Afghanistan. Now, in terms of Iran and other actors and China, how they viewed it, uh, the central relations. Um, the prominent feature of Chinese concerns when it comes to geopolitics and geosecurity was always three things, uh, maybe a three and a half, I would say. The first one was US and NATO, what are they doing? Second was India. Thirdly was, what, how would that impact, impact Pakistan? Because in a way they were trying to protect Pakistan from some of the spillover uh, you know, angers of Afghan partners. And then the half one was the economic part, which a lot of people, um, I mean, sometimes that half part takes over all those other three uh, other major factors that were there. And in terms of Iran, um, they were indifferent, honestly, um, of how, what Iran does. And they were, yes, engaging with Iranians. Um, and in terms of Central Asians, uh, the biggest concern they always had is their West Corridor that passes through, or, or one of the, uh, the, the BRI corridors passes through Central Asia. And they felt that all of these other regional terrorist groups like the Uzbeks, the IMU, the Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan, and Ansarullah of Tajikistan, and other, you know, uh, the, the, the Central Asian terrorist groups, whether they pose threats to their projects and how they should take measures to mitigate. Um, thank you. That was a, a very good, excellent whistle stop. And I, I, there's, we've got about, you know, just over 
we've got about 15 minutes, I think, left uh, in this session. And we've got about three quest three broad question areas I I I'd like to sort of finally cover. I think one, maybe you can address quite quickly. You briefly mentioned this in your comments. Um, what has been your experience of uh, with Chinese interlocking? This is coming from a question who's asking a question from Sweden. Um, she's asking, what's been your experience of your Chinese interlocutors in regards to their actual understanding of Afghan dynamics and Afghanistan more generally? What's been your sense of when you've interacted with them, both at a sort of governmental level and even a non-governmental level? What's been your sense of that? So if, if I could put that into context and briefly say, the Chinese had a strategic indifference um, after 1963 to Afghanistan, as I said. They understood little of Afghan culture, Afghan dynamics. They didn't care much either. It was a small border. Um, and um, as long as we don't pose any threat, um, that was fine. Until the Cold War, until the Soviets came to Afghanistan. At that time, they started taking an interest both because it brought the money, uh, Western funding for weapons uh, and for others to be given to the majority, Chinese weapons and others. And then they actually used Pakistan to understand Afghanistan um, because they were following this mercantilist foreign policy, non-intervention, you know, the five principles and, and all that uh, that existed. Um, um, and then after 9-11, um, with a more empowered, economically empowered China, they started, as we could put it, getting their hands dirty in a way, which is start understanding Afghanistan and, you know, uh, commissioning experts. And, and, and uh, you had Chinese who speak Pashto and Dari, our two national languages. Uh, and then you see the, the Confucius uh, Institute showing up at Kabul University and at different other universities opening branches and Afghan and training Afghans uh, to uh, in Chinese language. Um, but also um, lots of uh, going back and forth between Afghanistan and China. But that has been the cultural aspect of it and the understanding aspect of it has been one of the missed opportunities between Afghanistan and China being sharing a border. If you compare it to other Chinese neighbors, you have very few Afghans who really understand Chinese and who understand China. And you have very few Chinese uh, who actually understand Afghanistan. Now, that has changed in the past three to four years, I must say, because I visited China and I should thank them. They were very gracious uh, you know, uh, for hosting me. But then I went to Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences. I went to a dozen of other universities. You saw these centers on Afghan studies that they have. And then you have, you see a hundred uh, you know, Chinese coming to you who are only studying Afghanistan. Uh, and they speak some Dari and Pashto. Some of them actually speak, uh, they have a radio service right now on Afghanistan, the Chinese, the CRI uh, is there. Um, so they have, I think, uh, started investing in understanding Afghanistan in their think tanks and in their um, universities. And it astonished, it astonished me as an Afghan where I went in, in, in one of their study centers and I saw 80 people working on Afghanistan. Uh, maybe it's because of the sheer uh, population that they have is because they have to create work for people. But then at the same time you have, I, I, I was in another place where they had a center which, in which over 200 people were working. Now, I don't know where the Americans gone uh, the, those centers are still holding that through like 280 people or something that is still there. But there is definitely a gap. Um, Afghans don't understand China very well. Chinese don't understand Afghanistan. But I see some movements through the Confucius uh, Institute, through uh, you know, other um, uh, mediums and scholarships um, um, that they have uh, in, in hand. Well, wow, I mean, that's uh, quite a jump in uh, <laughs> from zero to 80 people working on it in one institute alone. That's a, a sort of extraordinary, which is not atypical within a Chinese context. Um, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about um, uh, the economic side of the question, the economic side of the coin. Um, and then I think a final question I, I want to come to as well. Well, actually, maybe I'll flip these around. So I, I, I'll ask you first a question, and this one's also coming from, uh, from uh, Frostburg State University again. And the question is about Eton and about militant Uyghurs, um, because this is something that you hear a lot about. 
you see referred to in the United Nations, you've referred to it a, a few times. Um, you see official statements about it, the Chinese talk about it a lot. And yet it's very hard to find many incidents that involve um, ETIM groups, either you know outside uh, Afghanistan um, or, or even within Afghanistan or even in China. I wonder, you know, and you talked about the sort of amounts who'd been released. Um, I wonder if you talk a little bit about the actual threat that you think this group poses. Um, you know, from your perspective as someone who's working in security in Afghanistan, um, what was your sense of the actual nature of the threat that was posed by uh, ETIM or TIP as it refers to itself or Uyghur militancy more generally? Um, so on, on the Afghan, I can only speak for Afghanistan um, and what I saw and what we uh, experienced in the battlefields, uh, our, our security forces with ETEM. Um, so ETEM is concentrated in Afghanistan in three provinces, well, four actually. Uh, the first one is Badakhshan. The most experienced fighters of ETEM is in Badakhshan. In fact, half of the battle of Badakhshan was won by ETEM, and ETEM families live as we speak right now in Badakhshan. Uh, the second concentration is in Kunduz uh, area of Afghanistan. Now, uh, these work under the, these these fighters are very experienced, uh, the fierce fighters, and uh, they um, uh, they, they are the most they, they wage the most complicated and complex attacks um, uh, on on Afghan forces. Then the third area is Logar, uh, which is orders. Um, Kabul, um, and essentially they were in cahoots with Haqqani network um, in, in Logar area. Uh, and Haqqani network provided uh, enabling enablers for them um, to operate. And then finally, uh, it was Jalalabad. Um, now, we have, we, we, we have uh, caught them on the battlefield. Um, we have had their families um, uh, who they have, uh, who we arrested uh, along with their families, um, uh, kids and, 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 uh, and others that we had to then, you know, uh, put them in another place, not in a prison. Um, so we have had uh, clashes with them. Um, when I say we, the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces, and they are real. Uh, um, they are real, they are experienced, they are skilled fighters, and they're indoctrinated fighters. Um, we have also had ETEM fighters in Afghanistan who fought in Syria, went to Vietnam, and came and fought in Afghanistan through Vietnam. Uh, we arrested them, and these are you know, uh, the, the, the information that we got out of them, how they ended up in Afghanistan. By the way, they went to Vietnam and Pakistan, and then through Pakistan, they came to Afghanistan. Hmm. So, uh, in terms of whether ETIM went inside uh, China and did anything there, the nature of Chinese state and society is it's so difficult to get these information and data. Um, we don't know. Um, but what we know is that the Chinese had lists of ETIM uh, militants and commanders that they thought were in Afghanistan and fighting. Um, which I don't know if now they do the same thing with with the, with the Taliban and offer them you know those lists and ask them for help um, uh, to tackle them. Our problem, the Afghan problem with Eton fighters, were that we are not your enemies. Why are you killing us? You are here, you know, to go to somewhere um, or or to stay here. You can lead a peaceful life. Why are you picking up guns and killing Afghan security forces? Um, An ETEM problem didn't start at this era. It started with the Sino-Soviet split and during the Afghan Jihad against the Soviets. So a lot of ETEM fighters started joining the Afghan Jihad through the Pakistani madrasas. And um, over the years, they became hardlined and trained and experienced fighters and commanders. And that's how they started fighting in Afghanistan, Syria, and in other theaters. So essentially for us as Afghans and Afghan National Security Forces, we were saying that 
Uh, you're a Muslim, I'm a Muslim, you know, why are you killing us uh, being Chinese, um, you know, citizens or whatever you consider yourself, you're definitely not Afghan. Um, so essentially, that is how we dealt with them. And eventually, the Afghan government decided that they're simply a terrorist group because they are killing Afghans and Afghan security forces. And that's how we dealt with them. So it must have been quite confusing when the Americans decided to delist ETIM as a terrorist organization. We were under pressure. We were under pressure. Our simple answer to that was anybody who fights Afghans, anybody who kills Afghans, our, our enemy. It's simple, whether it's the Punjabis or the ETIMs or the uh, Tajiks or the Uzbeks, anybody who comes in our soil and kill our security forces, we will go after them, no matter whether they are Uyghurs or, or, or I don't know, uh, Uzbeks or Tajiks or Chechens, because it's not their country. Uh, what are they doing waging jihad in my country? It, it, it was that simple. It's a fairly a blunt message. <laughs> You're fighting them on the battlefield. They need to be stopped. I wonder though if, if we could sort of maybe pull this, and I'll pull this into the last question, conscious that we have come up to the end of our time. And but I know we started a little bit late, so I'm going to let us creep over a little bit to me. I hope that's not uh, going to inconvenience you too much. Um, you know, how much or how seriously do you think? Well, do you think that the Taliban authority that's now taken over will be able to address these issues? Um, that clearly are going to concern the Chinese about ETIM, about border security. Um, do you think they'll be able to deliver on these concerns? And how much do you think that the, uh, do you see much opportunity for the Chinese to help um, pour, you know, economic and development aid into the country um, in such a way that they would sort of offer a transactional relation where they say, you know, we can offer you these benefits to help Afghanistan develop. As you point out, they've now developed a more substantial capability at home to understand the country. Do you think that they're gonna start putting economic investment behind that? And do you think that the, you know, the authority that's in Kabul now um, will be able to address the problems? Do you think that sort of there will be a kind of merger or a meeting of minds there? Well, first of all, it's uh, the, Af the, the current government, the Taliban regime uh, haven't yet pronounce their governance vision. Uh, they, there is no constitution. Uh, there is no service delivery. The economic and financial system is on the verge of collapse. Poverty is going to hit 95% according to UN in, in two months or even before. So it's a recipe for disaster um, if, um, if they don't act soon and uh, fix um, and, and basically formulate and pronounce their policies and governance vision and how they want to approach. Secondly, they don't have the resources, um, both financial and manpower, to be able to manage such a complex society like Afghanistan. Um, I always say that the transition from militancy to governance is, is, is a painful one, and oftentimes many of these groups fail. The third part of it is how do they deal with their foreign jihadi brothers, as they call them, the foreign terrorist fighters, which includes ETAM, because they would say that we fought with you, you know, shoulder by shoulder in your hardest times, and now that you have taken the government, you're trying to hand, over, hand us over to the, to the Chinese, I don't know, to Pakistanis and, and to others. Um, so at one point you would see um, um, what I see, uh, what I say as jihadi cannibalism, where they started killing each other because uh, either they were not loyal enough or they're not Muslim enough or they have, they have turned apostates. You already see a fighting going on between ISKP and the Taliban on that front, that the Taliban have became you know, friends of the Americans now because of the deal and they're not Muslim enough and therefore we should continue the jihad against them. Now, how would the Af uh, if you look at the experience of the 1990s uh, when the Taliban took over government or the Mujahideen took over the government, all the foreign jihadi fighters, the Jordanians, the Saudis, um, you know, Osama bin Laden included, others were given honorary Afghan citizenship and then a code of conduct and given really nice real estate property to live in until they started planning attacks on, on the West uh, and what they call foreign enemy. Um, and then things got really complicated. 
I believe the Taliban will not take action on their foreign terrorist fighters, on their foreign fighter element. Not only they won't take the action, but they would just play the game along because the moment they take action, they foment the stability and stability and division amongst their ranks. And then there would be another internal civil war within the Taliban, which would pave the way for their collapse. But they would issue, you know, what they call laiha, which is a code of conduct, uh, which, and, and give them places to stay with their families inside of Afghanistan and watch over them. Um, but that's not feasible because these people are constant jihadists. Uh, they move on from battlefield to battlefield. It's almost like an addiction for them. Um, so I think we have to be very careful and we have to uh, be very vigilant uh, about the foreign fighters which are um, which, which share a symbiotic relationship uh, with the Taliban and Taliban have traditionally been an umbrella for them for many years and I don't think they would give up on their jihadi programs anytime soon so it's going to be uh, I think a fool's paradise in a way or, or daydreaming to think that the next day they would hand over all their um, comrades to various respective um, uh, governments. I mean, one third of the Taliban fighting machinery are foreign fighters based on their existence. So we're talking about, you know, uh, more than uh, 20,000 people um, that have been fighting uh, in Afghanistan. Well, that's a, a somewhat depressing conclusion, but um, thank you uh, for that, Tamim. It was a really fascinating uh, tour de force. Uh, covering everything from the early history of Afghanistan's border relations. And thank you for going into it in such detail. Um, as I said, this series is specifically trying to understand that. And then really trying to then help us locate that in the sort of current uh, relationships in Afghanistan that exist between the, uh, the Taliban-led uh, government and uh, the government of Beijing and the sort of wider geopolitics of it. So thank you so much for giving us your experience. Um, we very much wish you the best and hope that things uh, settle in your country and that hopefully, you know, uh, China is able to maybe bring to bear some of its economic uh, wealth and might at least to help Afghanistan stabilize. I've always personally felt that was a huge missed opportunity. This is Afghanistan's richest neighbor and it, it seems it's a shame that it's contributed so little in sort of material costs in some ways. Um, but to me, this has been really wonderful. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Um, we'll be posting this afterwards online. Uh, to the rest of our audience, thank you so much for joining. Thank you for all your really great questions. There's a few in there that I didn't quite get to. I tried to put a bunch together, so I hope you heard yours in there. Um, but we're really delighted, and there was some really interesting stuff in there. Um, Young China Watchers, if you would like to know more about it, if you don't particularly, please feel free to sign up to our website, uh, which is youngchinawatchers.com, and you can get um, you can find out which your closest local chapter is. We have 10 around the world. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter, and also you can see our YouTube channel where we've got where we will post this uh, video and we have a number of other videos posted. I have to give a final thank you to my wonderful colleagues Josh and Sam who are lucky in the background but have been really instrumental in setting this entire series up. Um, and with that I will draw the webinar to a close and I will thank you all very much again and Tamim thank you very much, you and, very much and good luck and I look forward to hopefully getting to do something in person again at some point soon. Thank you very much.